Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event with Lawrence Goldborn. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the auditorium. In the event of an emergency, please walk, do not run, to the exit closest to you. Please also take a moment at this time to silence your cell phones. If you're with us on Twitter tonight, you can join the conversation with hashtag GoBorn, which you'll also find located on your program. And at this time, please take your seats. Thank you, and enjoy the program. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Dutch Leonard, and I'm the Baker Professor of Public Management at the Kennedy School, where I'm also the co-chair of the a program on crisis leadership, and I'm also the Elliot Snyder Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. And I'm delighted to be with you all this evening and to have a chance to welcome to our campus the Chilean Minister of Public Works, uh, Lawrence Goldborn, also famously the former Chilean Minister of Mining, uh, during an event we all remember, and also to have the privilege tonight of introducing our university president, Drew Faust. Uh, Minister Goldborn famously managed the rescue of 33 miners trapped 2,000 feet below ground in August to October of 2010, uh, something he just described in glowing detail to my MBA classroom. Uh, and as someone who studies crisis management, I can tell you that the crisis that he managed was technically complex, emotionally fraught and complex, and also politically complex. And many, many things had to go right for those 33 miners to be rescued. And those things did go right, and it's a huge credit to the people involved who in completely novel circumstances managed to learn their way forward uh, into a whole new paradigm uh, for mine rescue. We have so many negative examples, especially in mining, of disasters of this form, and it's just wonderful to have a positive model. So thank you, Minister Goldborn, for having created that positive model for us. So welcome all of you to tonight's discussion. Uh, which uh, promises to be very engaging. Uh, this evening is especially poignant as today also marks the beginning of our public service week here at the Kennedy School. This is central to the Kennedy School mission, and the week will also serve this year as the kickoff for Harvard's Global Month of Service uh, beginning on uh, the 1st of April. So it's my privile privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, the leader of that whole enterprise, uh, our Harvard University President, uh, Drew Faust. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, for joining us. Uh, president Faust is the 28th president of Harvard University and the Lincoln Professor of History in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she is committed to strengthening Harvard's international connections and to helping our students better understand the global community in which all of us live. Uh, last year, the president visited parts of South America, including Chile, uh, during spring break in uh, 2011. While there, she visited schools and met with uh, President Sebastian Piñera and officials in the Chilean government, and was also able to witness firsthand the remarkable reconstruction efforts following the 2010 earthquake and tsunami uh, that took place there, and witnessed the resilience of the Chilean people after the mining accident. I'm particularly pleased to know, Madam President, about earthquake resilience in Chile these days, because my younger daughter is studying in Chile this semester, where she's now been in two earthquakes in the last two days, including the latest 7.1 magnitude earthquake last night. Uh, so I'm pleased to know about the resilience of their uh, population and, and earthquakes. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce our President, Drew Faust. Thank you, Dutch. It's really a great pleasure to be here this evening, and it's always a pleasure to be here at the um, IOP and to think about the wonderful traditions that animate this room and everything that's happened in this room. It's a place where people have thought and reflected and debated for decades now, and we are very grateful for every one of you that makes this happen and that participates in it. Among those who have been here and who have spoken here at Harvard and here at the Kennedy School are two countrymen of the ministers, Michelle Bachelet and President, former President Michelle Bachelet and current President Sebastian Piñera. So we're glad that we have um, the minister here tonight to join in, in that marvelous legacy. 
Just about this time last year, I was traveling, as Dutch suggested, in Chile, witnessing the reactions to the earthquake and learning a great deal about Harvard's engagement with those issues. There was a seminar sponsored by the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies in collaboration with the Enlace Earthquake Reconstruction Project, where Harvard faculty and representatives from all over Chile joined together to talk about what the lessons learned were, how our knowledge can help us in response to disasters like this, and how we can join together across nations to use knowledge in ways that advance our common interests. One of the ideas that was discussed at that meeting, and one that's remained with me, was Dean David Elwood's call to try to spur others to action and engagement by making problems vivid, by sharing common insights and experiences so that we can reach beyond our own locales and our own knowledge and reach out to others. Our distinguished guest here tonight has a great deal to share about managing crisis, about leadership, about the power of hope and optimism and imagination, teamwork and commitment. On August 7, 2010, Minister Lawrence Goldborn arrived at the San Jose mine collapse. It was the beginning of a nearly 10-week ordeal that thrust him into the global spotlight and led to approval ratings that I don't think any politician any of us has ever known has had the privilege of enjoying. With the 33 men trapped 2,000 feet below the earth, their anxious loved ones joined with people around the globe to depend on this minister's insight and wisdom and compassion. And he offered what has been called a leadership lesson for the ages. Dean David Elwood and I had the great privilege of spending time with him in Chile when we were there last year. And as I listened to him tell the story of the mining rescue over breakfast one morning last March, including the dramatic moment when the capsule came up, not empty, but with a note inside for the very first time, I was determined from that spine-chilling uh, second when he told of, of that story, that he must come to Harvard and tell his story here and share the kinds of decisions and the kinds of difficulties that he faced during those dramatic days. Among the most memorable of the images from that time is a photograph of Minister Goldporn inside one of the Phoenix capsules that were um, into the earth and would eventually bring each of the miners up to the surface. That image for me represents something enormously important about our guest, about his desire to understand the realities and experiences of the people he serves, his determination to literally put himself in their shoes, or in this case, in their capsule, in order to be able to share the kinds of issues that those he represents are facing. It's that quality that has made him such a beloved public servant. It is that quality that continues to distinguish his career now, now as Chile's Minister of Public Works. And it is that quality that I hope you all will come to understand a bit of in your interactions with the minister here this afternoon. Please join me in welcoming to Harvard and to the Forum, Minister Lawrence Goldborn. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. President Faust, I am very glad to be here. Professor Lonar, for me it's an honor that you discussed this case in your class and it was very interesting some minutes ago to share my experience with your students. So any semester you can invite me, I have no problem to come. Well, um, I will talk to you about public policy, leadership, and crisis management. So let's start for the definition of crisis. This is the first thing that I did when I was uh, thinking about this presentation. And I went to the dictionary in English, and 
Well, I found this definition that you can read here, but the third one I think is the most interesting. Crisis is an unstable and crucial or crucial time or status of affairs in which a decisive change is impending, especially one with a diff distinct, distinct possibility of a highly undesirable outcome. So here, oops, we're talking about instability, decisive decision in spending, possibility of highly undesirable outcome. Essentially a crisis happens when all the rules fail. Crises are inspected, there is no warning, no time for previous preparation, there is no information no, normally. This crisis normally challenge the normal decision-making processes, sometimes challenge the person which is in charge. Normally crises are unique and all the time they are urgent. In the other side, public policy is usually designed on previous experience and for civil events. Individuals can complement and partly substitute for institutional responses, which are many times inadequate in highly uncertain environments. And how the government operates? Well, essentially by procedure. Agency acts according to the law. Individually, government agencies interact only as established by administrative law and regulations. And normally, agencies are slowly because you have to interpret it to see what you can do, what you are forbidden to do, etc. In the case of Chile, according to the Library of the Congress, we have more than 200. 45,000 different laws and regulations. So in a crisis, you have to be prepared to act by the rules. So we face this different or complicated situation. We have an instability, decision that had to be made, uncertainty, but you have to act by procedure, individually, and you have to understand in which frame you have to be fair, behave. In this uh, scenario is where leadership take a complementary role. And using the conclusion of Yusim Jordan and Koletic that wrote a paper about this issue, I will use that these uh, three categories that they propose. They said that leaders have to take responsibility for the resolution of the crisis they have to build a top team for the management of that crisis and to choose actions and try to end the crisis. Well, let's go to the third thing. Who is in charge? And here we have a good example for the responsibility issue is in the US financial crisis. The chart that I am showing here was published in The Economist last February, and show how oversight will look like in the financial sector after the Dodd-Frank Act. Again, my point is not related to this piece of regulation, but rather to point out how difficult it is to act in an environment where there are dozens of agencies involved in the working of such a complex system. So if there is a problem in one piece of that chart, who has to deal with it? Who will lead? the crisis. Let's use another example, the Fukushima nuclear disaster. The second idea is to try to assemble a team, but in the middle of a crisis with an earthquake and a tsunami, it's not easy to find the right people that knows not only about nuclear disaster, but only that knows that power plant, that specific site their processes, who is or who has the information that you need, how the information is challenged, who is responsible for processing it, how can an expert team be assembled. 
for who has the specific knowledge of this power plant. All those kind of things happen when you have to face this challenge of assembling a team. Then you have to implement the solution. Let's use another example. Crisis often have a very limited set of feasible solutions. And here leadership plays a very important role in creating the necessary consensus to implement actions. In the European economic crisis, once a feasible solution is found, who make it happen? Role of political authorities in this case is critical. And also, you have to deal with people. How do we make society part of the solution? Key issues, key issue when options are few. In our case, this is a previous version of the presentation. That's why I'm a little bit <laughs> nervous. Yes, I have to see there. Uh, well, we have faced in my position as minister um, different kind of disaster. For instance, the eruption of the Cauji volcano in the southern of Chile, and we have to deal with evacuation of people and to prevent a major disaster. We also had some political problems, political crisis. For instance, installing a new tax in the mining sector that will affect the whole of the most important industry in the country. Initially, this negotiation in Congress failed, but we had to deal with this issue and finally to try to figure out a solution to try to give stability to a whole sector. The earthquake in 2010, and President Faust mentioned it, we had to deal with a very complex situation. And after two years, we have recovered more than 1,500 kilometers of roads destroyed, 290 bridges, system for water distribution, etc. And we had to reconstruct and to make the country work and grow and to continue working. We also face environmental and social upheaval. This kind of crisis are every time more frequent. For instance, in my case, I had to deal with the crisis of the natural gas in Magallanes, where people was complaining because we had to raise the tariff for a product that is essential in the zone, but is scarce. And sometimes people, things get tough. And it's not easy. That guy that is with the jacket got a bottle in his neck one second after this photograph. But finally, everything could be solved with the right dialogue and using the right tools. Obviously, the most important crisis that I had to face was the privilege that President Piñera gave me when he appointed me as the responsible for the rescue or finding of these 33 men that were trapped under 700 meters of rock. Más de 30 mineros permanecen atrapados tras derrumbe en Minas San José en la región de Atacama. No se sabe si hay heridos, no se sabe si está comida o si alcanzaron a llegar a emergencias donde tienen oxígeno solo para 48 horas. En la chimenea se está bajando, se produjeron. What we faced here was a very unusual cave-in. It wasn't a traditional one. Normally in a mine, you have the collapse of a certain section. You enter there to put some protections into the tunnel and to try to move the rocks that fell and open up a path to rescue people, etc. But in this case, it wasn't that way. We knew it after. At that moment, we know really nothing. 
but in this case, a huge block collapsed, a mega block of the size of a building, really, moving inside the mine, completely blocking all the access from the outside. And here we had the key decision, the decision of President Piñera to get the whole government involved in this issue. I was commenting in, in the class of Professor Leonard that I haven't seen any other example in the world in a disaster like this or a similar like this where a government get involved voluntarily in these kind of things. Because this was a disaster that happened in a private property, in a private mine, and where we had all the possibilities to say, well, we are gonna stay out, we will see how you do it, and then we look for responsibilities. But in this case, President Piñera named me as Ministry of Mine in charge of the coordination of all the rescue effort. And I think that was a very brave decision that he made and a very risky one. And I mentioned previously in the class that you can imagine where I could be if everything would have been wrong in this case. Probably not here for sure. <laughs> well, the physical presence of the authorities in San Jose Mine was a must. We had a large number of family members there and they need help, they need support, they need basic elements. They had no place to where to sleep or food or even, even sanitary uh, conditions. We have to deal with security, public order, and also with health problem and management of the media that immediately arrive at the point trying to follow what's, what's going on there. And of course, the technical issue that we have to start making a working team that could help us in, in this process. The first thing that we did was to try to understand what was going on. Here you have a copy of one of the news that was talking about 34 miners. And I put this new here because it shows you that the beginning we knew nothing. There were a lot of rumors, people saying that there were 34, 37, that there were some illegal workers there, Peruvians, Bolivians, whatever. So nobody knew anything. Some people were saying that all the miners were dead, that we were hiding the information, etc., etc. So we have to deal with lack of information and also lack of technical information. We didn't have all the technical information, the topology of the mine, and we didn't have all the experts because certainly the professional team of the mine, which is a quite medium-sized, small mine, um, was overload and under pressure that, at that moment. We define a team of people that work together for this solution. I was commenting before that when you work in any activity, normally you have to motivate people. When in my previous life, when I was an executive in the private sector, I always said that we have to create a dream, a dream that you have to tell people in order for them to be motivated to work for. Well, in this case, I have to say that that dream was easier. Every novel people want to work for saving life of a human being. So that part was easy at the beginning. At the beginning, everybody wants to help. Everyone's, everyone wants to do something. But obviously, as time goes by and as days pass and you don't get success, that optimism and those good uh, feelings vanish a little bit. We structured the, the, the work in this uh, team in the way that is schedule or shown in this schedule. I had a group of people, led by Jimena Matas, which is the head of the regional government, dealing with all the 
family, family's problem. Giving them support, shelter, solving health problems, solving familiar problems, etc. Then we had to deal with all the health issues in the camp, but also thinking in what we will do if we find them, how we will treat them, the minors, how we will feed them after many days, what consequences of this accident could be, how we will deal with a disease down there into the mine. All those questions were answered by this health team that was led by the Ministry of Health. We also had the whole support of the Ministry of Mine, my team, the people was working there, helping me with all the media management. From the Ministry of Interior, we had internal affairs, we had all the support for security and managing the, the police and controlling the situation in the camp. And also we had a technical team that we divided in three different groups. One working in, inside the mine, other working in the boreholes, and a third one that was established in Santiago that was dealing with any idea that could help us to solve this problem. These guys, which were never on TV, were never on the news, were very important because they had to evaluate any technical possibility all over the world to try to see whether it could be useful for us. And for instance, we received their suggestion from mediums, um, technical people, normal people. We called every embassy that we had all over the world looking for solutions, technical things, etc. So it was a very important task what they did. And they designed, they, were, they started designing the technical way to get them out if we found it. And we start doing it in advance, even without knowing they were, if they were alive or not, we were discussing how to do it, where the machines were, how much it cost. Because as one of the students asked me how we evaluate here the profitability of this enterprise. Well, you cannot, but at least being responsible, and I knew at that moment that probably will ask me after, I had to deal with cost. I mean, how much is gonna cost this whole effort? So that team helped us, helped me a lot, and these are the real makers of this miracle. And we had different alternatives. The most logical one was to try to get them out through the ventilation shaft, we, which had no ladder, like this picture. <laughs> if there were a ladder, it would have been much easier. But uh, it was risky because the mine was in movement. I mean, the mine was unstable. And we worked on that alternative for more or less two weeks. And after those two weeks, when the, we had a, the possibility of an accident inside the mine, we decided not to continue in that way. I remember that I said that I want that meeting when we decide not to do it on record. Because it's a very hard decision that you have to make. Say, well, we are not gonna continue doing this alternative, which it was the most likely way to get them, because it's too risky for the people which is working on this. Make it, maybe you were making a decision of life or death at that moment. This uh, whole issue was an exercise of frustration. The, as I said, the ventilation shaft alternative was unsuccessful. The shaft collapsed the third day then we start working on it again, but after two weeks, we decided that it was too risky to continue working on that. In parallel, we start working through props, boreholes. That was the only alternative left. Drilling machines are not made for this purpose. These drilling machines are made to try to get a feeling of the reserve of our mind, to look for characteristic of the geology, geology, and never has been used to get a specific point 700 meters down the earth, especially 
over very solid rock. Nobody has previous experience for reaching so low with the level of precision required. So we try and try, and after 17 days, we had no success. For instance, in the first 14 days, until August 18th, we never were able to get below the level 400. We had to reach level 700. Because the machines deviate, the hammer broke, different things. So we failed for those two weeks. And when on August 19th, I remember very well because on August 20th, the birthday of my youngest son, on August 19th, finally we had one prof, one hole that was at the level of the meter and was pointing to two tunnels. Well, we missed. Later, we knew that we missed by only 12 inches. But that day was a terrible frustration. That day was really complicated. I know because that night I flew back to Santiago to see my son, and I turned on TV immediately as I arrived that night, and I see that on direct dispatch from the mine, there was a riot. I mean, the families wanted to take over the mine, and they wanted to do the rescue. That happened all the time. That was something that I had to control every day. Every day I had to deal with people that was saying that we were doing the wrong thing, that we were doing stupid things, that we knew nothing, and we had to do it something different. I had a treasury hunter that went there. He asked me permission for see and apply certain techniques. I asked him what kind of techniques. He told me, well, you know, it's too complicated. I say, well, maybe I'm not that smart, but I, I am an engineer, I have some knowledge, maybe, can you explain it based on what is your technology, I mean, based on waves, based on, well, he explained me a couple of things that I don't know if I didn't understand them or was very strange for me at least. But I allowed them because this guy, as many other, were carried them by a lot of, how do you say, uh, alcaldes, majors of some cities that surrounded the mine. I mean, I cannot say no, you are not allowed to enter. So I had, I had to say, well, yes, you're right. And I have a written report now. The written report after one day that this guy put some machines, etc., said that we were everything wrong. We were looking in the wrong place, pointing to the wrong way, <laughs> wrong in the wrong direction, etc., etc. It's already written. Fortunately, he was wrong. But those kind of things happen all the time. I had to deal with mentalists. I remember one night. Now it sounds or could could sounds a little bit funny, eh? But please imagine 11.30 p.m. in a very cold desert night in Atacama Desert, in a camp, in a tent, with a mentalist that is telling you that she could, she went into the entrance of the mine and he felt and he could, she could see the miners hurt. I remember the her words. They are hitting their tools, some of them injured, there are dead people. There is a guy with broken legs crying and asking for us to rescue them. At that moment I remember, and, and I, I am telling you this history and I feel something. <laughs> it's not easy, it was terrible. Well, those kind of things happen over those 17 days. As I said, we're 16 days or 17 days of only frustration. So leadership must go beyond technical skills. So you have to deal with critical issues to manage pressure, to manage a lot of pressure, really. That's maybe key 
in any people that have to leave any task. But fortunately, we had good news after 17 days. Let me share with you one of the most beautiful moments that I live in my life. Because I think more than the day that we took out these guys, maybe that August 22nd is the most important life that I have had the opportunity to live. Because I said that all this frustration, all this effort had a result. You saw in the movie how people went down to their needs, thanking to God, thanking to nature, thanking to whatever for the luck that we have, and uh, thinking that these people were alive. I was prepared for everything. I was, um, and we had protocols for different things, but we never thought that we would find them so well and alive, the three of them. And it was a possibility, but we were prepared for the worst. And, and it was very, very good to, to, to know that everything went okay. Well, after that, as I said before, I have said many times, um, during those 17 days, no one wants to be there. After the day 17, everybody wants to be there. <laughs> it was a little bit easier. We saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and from here and on, it was a matter of effort, money, and time to get them out. Maybe it could have taken us, I don't know, one year, but we will get them out. But time was of the essence, because a medical problem or any situation down there could be complicated. So. We have to do it as fast as we can. As I said before, in the technical staff in Santiago, we designed different ways to deal with the rescue if we found them. The first plan that we devised was uh, the plan A with a race borer machine, which is a machine that is used to make ventilation shaft, if very precise a little bit slow, but uh, it was a good alternative. We start with this plan on August 15, more or less, because the machine was in one division of Colelco, and we gave the order to disassemble it and to send it to be sent to San Jose Mine. So the machine arrives two or three days after we found them, and we start the process of installation of this machine immediately. The second plan was to make the hole using an oil drilling machine that was expensive, complicated. It's a very large machine that required more or less two football fields to be installed. So we had to do it. We had to move, move a lot of, of, of rocks and earth to give a space for this machine to be installed. And we did it. And then there is, again, the genius of the people that, in my opinion, are the real heroes or makers of these miracles. The people of Los Sondajistas, the people that was in charge of the drilling machines, the people that, the engineers that planned and designed these holes that we were making. As we finally got targeted in three different holes, because we did it three times. That is telling you that it, not, it wasn't by chance. This guy learned how to do it, which is 
complicated. As we had three holes that connect in different places the mine with this, we used two holes for feeding them and the second one, the first for feeding them, the second one to give them the basic elements, water, energy, communication, fresh air. So the third hole in my plan was, uh, I mean, it was going to be used as a backup. But here, these guys came to me, came to, to also to Andres Ugarre, and they explained that they could try to enhance that hole that was five inch wide to 15 inches first with a drilling machine too, the same drilling machine that they were using, changing the head. And then if we could make a new hammer 32 inches wide, we could try to do it wider and use it to get the miners out. The risk using two holes was there. I mean, we can fail, we can make a mistake, and to lose one of those holes, to, so the idea of to have a third one was a good one. My question was how much it cost, obviously. <laughs> but it was not that expensive because, and to, uh, excuse me, Koyawasi was providing the machine for free, so we had to send to this ham for this hammer to be made. So the cost was in below $2 million. So I say, let's do it. And they start. And well, the, the system had a lot of problem. I remember when we were working in the first enhancement, no, in the second enhancement, the hammer broke and leave a piece of, of iron inside the hole. We had to create a sort of a spider that went down and took it out. Well, all of those kind of things happened during this process. But finally, was the plan called num plan B. Should have been the C, but I don't know why it finally <laughs> ended up being the B. And uh, finally was the right one. a las cientos de personas que han trabajado en estos 69 días para llegar a la etapa que estamos viviendo hoy. Pero principalmente, Presidente, yo quiero agradecerle a usted el privilegio de parte de su gabinete y que usted me haya encargado y nominado esta tarea, que me llena de orgullo, me llena de satisfacción y que de verdad creo es un ejemplo para el país entero. Muchas gracias. This is the second happiest day of my life. <laughs> when after 70 days, we took out the three miners and the six person that we sent down there too. And after 48 hours with no sleep, we could say that we had finished this job. I slept for 15 hours, something like that after that. <laughs> But it was really, really a happy moment. Well, just some final thoughts. Why was this uh, rescue mission successful? Maybe three main issues. Team building, hard work, and motivation. 
were key. There is no single hero or defining moment, but the sum of efforts of hundreds of men and women that worked for these men to be safe and back to their lives. The second issue is related to optimism, resilience, maybe. Failures must be overcome in order to succeed. Things will not work out the first time, nor the second. Constancy and optimism will always be part of a success story. And the third issue, especially here in a university, complex problems have no single formula and solution. In all the tests that probably you have as students, you have data, you have the information, and you can solve it. I remember when I was a student, sometimes I had, or I felt that I didn't have all the information, and I complained to the professor, saying, well, how you can pretend that we are going to solve this test without all the information? Well, now I understand. <laughs> the typical chart flows, well designed, etc., sometimes has to be replaced by this handwritten scheme improvised on the field. So judgment, experience, and intuitions are also very important in any success story. So now I'm ready for answering any question. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was an incredibly rich description of this compelling event. We do have time for a few questions. We have microphones for this purpose on the floor, so if you have a question, please come to one of the microphones. Um, there, I want to introduce you to the rules about questions in the forum. First of all, we always have people who appear in the forum answer questions. So you're joining a long tradition, Mr. Minister, of, uh, uh, in this regard. Uh, the rules are these. First, identify yourself uh, first. Say who you are and uh, where you're from. Uh, second, one brief question per person. The only speech tonight was the minister's speech, and we've already had that one. Uh, so no, no speeches, one brief question. And a question is a short series of words with a question mark at the end. That's the, those are the three rules. Uh, so please, uh, please, Mr. Minister, if you'd like to come up. Muchas gracias, Ministro. My name is Jaime Besa. I'm a student here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and I'm from Chile. During the last years, there have been several social movements in Chile demanding more from the state. Currently, the government is proposing a tax reform that, among other things, increases the corporate tax, which are relatively low compared to other countries. When you were a CEO of one of the largest Chilean enterprises, you could understand the negative impact of such a reform for, for your company. Now that you are in the government, how that experience is serving you to balance those trade-offs between the public and the private sectors to better serve the country as a whole and lead Chile to become a true developed country. Thank you. Well, very important question. I mean, I think that probably those that are involved in financial issues uh, understand that any change or any increase in taxes is not a, it, I mean, it do has an effect. The question is how to manage this tool properly. Because on the other hand, you already have a lot of needs in the country. So in one way, you can create jobs, prosperity, to make the country move. And in the other side, you need money for finance, the significant changes that our society required urgently. So in my opinion, we have to move that tuner. It's going to have effect, yes. Economical theory tells us that it do have effect. But the point is whether this negative impact in the entrepreneurial side will be compensated by the positive issues. And in my opinion, the, propose, the proposal that President Piñera is going to make very soon is going to balance properly this risk and this benefit and this cost. The change in, in the 
corporate tax for companies. It did not affect foreign investment, for instance, because in the case of Chile, we have a corporate tax of 17%, now momentarily rose, rose to 20%, but 17% over local income. But that is a credit for foreign investors for the final tax that they have to pay, which is 35%. So at the moment that you don't move that 35%, you are not making a new impact over foreign investment, other than the impact on the impact on cash flow, which it will means that you have to finance in your cash for a while that payment of taxes. So it's something that could be managed and it's something that I think companies can live for, especially in the current economical moments. The point is how we are going to deal with small companies in Chile. And that is key in this package and in my knowledge I cannot anticipate anything, is something that had been took in consideration by the finance minister. So my position is that we do have to make these changes. And after we establish a reassignment of the taxes, increasing some, reducing others, trying to make a good system, the key question will be how to expend that money properly. Because it's not a matter of just to increase taxes and to get in the state more money. Because if that money is not used well, all the effort that you are making will be no. Thank you. Let's go to the next microphone on the second story. Buenas noches, Ministro. My name is Alejandra, also Tilian, and also a student here in Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, well, as Tilians, we are proud that people of your quality decide to accept the challenge of being part of the public sector and to lead successfully a long list of complicated negotiations and events that have occurred in our country since 2010. The temptation of quitting and return to the private sector must be sometimes really high. I am sure that we as students of HKS want to hear, um, why, uh, want to hear which are the benefits uh, of the public sector that you perceive that overcome the problems of bureaucracy, hi, hard negotiation with the Congress, and, uh, and all the problems that you have suffered all these two years that motivate you to continue as a public servant? Oof, I have been asking that for the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to be very honest with you. Um, during 48 years in my life. For different reasons, I got married when I was a student, etc. So I was uh, working essentially for my own welfare and my families. And uh, when President Piñera, a person that I didn't know, I mean, before he appointed me as minister, called me to participate in his government, my first reaction was saying, well, why me? I mean, why I have to go to do this, you're right. Sometimes when we work in the private sector and you have a success career, you want to help, but you are not uh, so motivated to do it. It's something that never passed in my mind. And here, well, as many of us probably, you do have a guard angel, guardian angel. Maybe this one is my wife. She told me, well, you always said that somebody has to do something. You always said that our country needs a lot of things. Well, who is going to do it? Why don't you go to help? I mean, you're going to continue working for what for? We have, fortunately, everything that we need. I am not a rich man. I came from a middle class family. My parents never finish even school. I am the first generation that has a professional degree. So I have been successful, quote, in terms of what many people think. So I had a good living. So to continue working for what? My family has more or less secured what they need. They can study, which is the most important thing. 
So under or after those arguments, <laughs> I had nothing else to say than yes. <laughs> so I entered to the public service with that uh, motivation. But I have to confess that every day I felt that I made the best decision in my life. Because uh, every time that I feel, I mean, personally, I had the opportunity to live something very special. I mean, just for the case that we already discussed, I am overpaid for all my life being a public servant. <laughs> because it's something so, such, I mean, such a unique experience that it's, it's very important for me to have lived. But uh, going to more daily activities, to see the face of people when they get drinkable water at their homes, or to see an indigenous farmer, I mean, a farmer that belongs, a Mapuche farmer, that tell, is telling me, Minister, you know, this road that you are putting pavement now will allow me that, me, that my raspberry comes to the town not as pulp, not as much because of the road. Now I'm going to have to be able to sell them for, as fruit. And that makes a lot of difference for me because it means that I'm going to have a better life for me and my family. And that is what a road means. Something that you experience when you are there with people. Something that Professor Roller mentioned. That is true. I like to be with people, to understand those kind of things. You are not building roads. You are not building bridges. You are building opportunities for people. That is what that, in, that infrastructure do. And you get the payment of your effort every day in those, fa in those phases. Sometimes it's hard, you're right. Sometimes it's complicated. Last week, for instance, I was in the Congress and I was in a commission. And well, the situation was complicated. And you get mad, I mean, you get in bad mood. And a Congresswoman asked me for the fifth time, when I gonna receive her in my office? And I say, when I have time, very rude. I have to confess. That night, to say, when I have time, I think it's rude, but it's not an offense. But that night, that was published by newspapers, as that I was a rude man. Well, no matter what, anyway, I felt bad, because I am not that way. And the morning after, I called her privately and asked her for is, I mean, I gave her my apologies. But those kind of things are a little bit disappointing from time to time. But you have to think in the face of that Mapuche farmer to continue going on. We're going to go to the third microphone, the second one on the second floor. I can see, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have time for all the questions. I see many eager questioners, but let's go to this next microphone. Thank you very much. I'm Cesar Díaz Carrera. I'm professor of public leadership at Complutense University in Madrid. Thank you, Minister, for, your, for sharing this wonderful success story. You seem to be a technologist that became a humanologist. I don't know if you became a humanologist in the, in the process of uh, leading this uh, wonderful adventure, or you were already before. But if credibility and uh, effectiveness are the two pillars of leadership, I would like to know uh, what specific provisions did you take to ensure that uh, you, were, you, you, you could keep the morale of the people high and that you could be perceived as someone credible and effective to carry out this uh, very, very difficult, very hard mission. Thank you. Well, that is uh, very hard. And as every day passes there, I was more concerned about the moral of people. As I said at the beginning, everybody wants to cooperate. But uh, we were just discussing this uh, some minutes ago with President Faust. Uh, probably Colón faced the same when he was traveling from Puerto de Palos to the Indian. At the beginning, everybody wants to go, but after a while, some 
Some of them wanted to go back. Well, that happened. It's human nature. I try to, I am a positive person. I try to keep them, people, motivated with the task that we were doing. Two things, two ways to do it. Every day I went to talk with people that was working with machines, and I thanked them. I told them, thanks for the effort that you're doing. This is the most important job that you're making in your life. You're not making a hole. You're looking for a human being. And those guys in, in those machines felt the And the second issue was to try to isolate those technical guys from the political, familiar, uh, media problem that we were facing. So in that way, they, they were focused on their task, not dealing with other things. When these uh, majors came with the specialists, when I received the mentalists, when I, <laughs> when I had to answer the question of the media, etc., in general, we tried to keep technical people aside, isolated. But uh, I have to confess, confess that I had the doubt in my life, in my mind, in terms of for how long we are going to be continue looking for these guys. And it's something that I talked to the president in a certain moment, not asking for a quest for an answer, but just putting the question in terms that at a certain moment he would have had to make that decision. Fortunately, we never get, we never got that moment. But um, I was uh, feeling after two weeks that some people was disappointed. Some people came to me and say, well, you know, boss, we, we have been here for two weeks. I have to go back. Uh, my job is waiting. People that give for free some services say, start saying, well, you know, I thought that it would have been two or three days, one week, but now there are 14 days, 15 days. So that situation would have been critical probably after 30, 30 days. I don't know why 30, maybe 25, but I don't know. At a certain moment of the time, it would have been very critical. But the key maybe is realism, but with a large quote of optimism. Hi, my name is Jacob Morello, and I'm a freshman here at Harvard College. And I'm asking this question on behalf of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Student Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Um, thank you so much for coming and, and sharing your inspirational story. Um, the question that I have is, how, what role, clearly there were a lot of emotions going on, um, and I'm sure they ran wild among you and, and the people that you were trying to lead and motivate. Did you find yourself having to detach yourself from the emotions so that you could accomplish the task at hand? Or did you allow those emotions to motivate and inspire you to achieve that? Did you distance yourself from the emotions or did you um, embrace them? You know, the, maybe I have a problem, which is, I have said this many times, I am where I am. I cannot be a separate person. I am a, an emotional person. You know, maybe it was good at the end, but the day number two on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, when we fail in the first attempt to go to the level 100 through the ventilation shaft, and I received the rescuer that were on top of that position, they almost died there. When they went out, came out to, of the mine, dirt, I mean, um, how do you say, absolutely covered by dust, crying, saying they are all dead, we can do it, etc. And I embrace them. I start crying. And I made the mistake, thinking from many months after, uh, of comply with something that I have said to the families. Every time that I had some important news, I will tell them directly, first to them, then to the media. So I embrace them, we talk a little bit, I get 
okay, I got okay, and say, well, let's go to talk to the families. But I was in an emotional state which it was complicated. So when we started talking, I was talking to a multitude, I mean, larger than this one. And I was trying to keep my eye over the people. But at a certain moment, I saw down there, and I saw the daughters of Franklin Lobos. And this, the scene was so moving because, you know, many people was crying. Many people were crying and yelling, but they were not, they, they were silent, watching me with the eyes full of tears. They start running their face and I couldn't continue speaking. And well, that is what I feel. I am a person that when I am happy, you can tell that I am happy. When I am mad, you can tell that I am mad. That's why I, ask, I answer when I have time. <laughs> That's me. And it's something that I don't want. Normally people said that in politics, you have to have hard skin. I don't want to have hard skin. To be, if in order to be a politician, I have to harden my skin. I want to be a politician. I want to get moved by people, get angry when you have to, and get happy when you feel it. I think we have time for two more questions, if they promise to be quick. Short and quick. So we're I'm, one I'm a short guy, I have a short question. Thank you very much for sharing a wonderful example of um, dissecting the moment and being very uh, transparent and, and very heartfelt about what you went through. Um, I'm part of a group called Six Degrees of Humankind, people who've been through emergencies, people who've worked with screens and seen screens help with information and screens be not so helpful in stirring up feelings and narratives that don't fit. Did you at any point sense there were people in the media or in the internet world who are working at a distance to help you with whatever capacity, whatever modeling, whatever resources, whatever engineering you would have welcomed at a distance? Because this is the NASA model, right? Apollo 13, people at a distance help people who are in a situation and they came up with a solution together. Did anyone approach you about that, or would you welcome that kind of thing? Because, and we have a volunteer. Because we have people in distress all over the world, and often the information and the help and the models are somewhere else. All we have to do is start to share them. And I'm wondering whether people have come to you and made that offer. Your promise here. <laughs> well, uh, all the media was uh, very important in, in this whole story, because uh, as I mentioned before, we use all our effort to try to get ideas and contact with many countries, look for technologies that were available to help in this issue. So through social network, through formal medias, people got informed of this. And I think uh, we had a good reception everywhere where we called. I remember I called somebody here from Langley, asking for special technologies if you have uh, here in the state. And the person received my call immediately and, and very, and trying to help. We received some ideas from people too, some crazy ideas, maybe a couple of ideas that could be adapted or used, uh, especially from technicians that were not consulted direct, directly, but they say, well, I know this, etc." So that's why we established this group in Santiago, this technical group, that every serious idea that we received was analyzed by them and to see whether it could be useful or not. Um, but I think the most important effect was that this uh, event was widespread and known all over the world that opened up many doors. Final question. This is not work. Buenas tardes, Ministro. My name is Maria Paz Dominguez, and I wanted to ask you about meritocracy in Chile. 
So you seem to be an example of meritocracy, but given all the social movements that now we are observing in our country, um, what, what, how do you see classism playing a role in the dream of meritocracy? Yeah, our country is a complex one. Well, maybe I've been working in different Latin American countries in my previous experience, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, Brazil. Every country has his uh, particularities, but ours is complicated. Classism is something that is, that is, uh, that exists. And we have to deal with it. But I think it happens all over Latin America. Uh, it's a cultural thing that we have to change. As uh, information technology evolves, the media and this uh, social network that spread out over the world, I think this kind of things, information will be the key to change that. People don't accept things that in the past they used to. The information plus a better, a better standard of life, I, I think it will make the difference. And the real lever to change that definitely is education. No doubt about it. As you mentioned, maybe an example of that. I studied in a fiscal public school. I studied at the university with a credit that the state gave to me, a credit that I paid when I got success and I got the resources to do it. And yes, my family now has a different opportunity that probably the opportunity that I have and the opportunity that my parent has had. We need that for all our country. Sometimes I feel that some people is wrong in terms of you have probably have seen on TV that people is asking for free education. Well, education in Chile is free. Basic education and media education is free. University education is not for free. And well, if we were a very rich country, probably yes, we could do it. No problem with that. But we have a 60 billion fiscal budget for the whole country needs. One fifth of that today is destined to education. If I had more money, I couldn't give free university for all, because in my opinion, that will conserve all this difference. The only way to break that difference is to put all that money, all that extra money, in pre-basic and basic education. There is the problem. When a small child of fifth degree cannot read, or in seventh degree, cannot understand what he reads. Who cares about university free education? That guy will not get there anyway. That's the problem, in my humble opinion. So I think education is a great note on which for us to end tonight. Um, and uh, we want to thank you, Minister Goldborn, for bringing such a rich description of this compelling event to us and for showing us a really positive and wonderful model of how to bring people together uh, in extreme and demanding and novel circumstances uh, in the face of enormous pressure, but to persevere in the face of repeated failure and to eventually succeed. And it's a wonderful, we're going to be studying this model for years and appreciate that. I also want to ask you to join me in thanking uh, President Faust tonight, uh, whose determination it was that we needed this event and we needed to hear this at Harvard that made it possible for us to have this event. So thank you. For, for that. Can I say something? Absolutely. Don't, 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 don't go. Please. I brought a small present for President Faust and for Professor Lohner. This is a small piece of rock, but it comes from 
the holes that we made in the San Jose mine. <laughs> there are very little of these pieces, and I want to give you duly sign showing authenticity, sorry, <laughs> that, but I want you to keep it as a souvenir, as a memory of this event. This one is for you. It's, it's dropping the hole. <laughs>